Dear colleagues, welcome to this lecture. I am Tomás Solymosi, member of the Ultrasound Board of the European Thyroid Association. This lecture discusses two seemingly independent, but indeed closely related topics, the ultrasound presentation of lymphocytic thyroiditis and the relation between discrete lesion seen on the ultrasound and pathological nodule. The first of the considerations is that hypochagenicity is the hallmark of autoimmune thyroid diseases, particularly lymphocytic thyroiditis. On the one hand, we lack highly enough sensitive and specific patterns to diagnose lymphocytic thyroiditis in most cases. On the other hand, we can rely on clinical and laboratory data. There are two basic forms of lymphocytic thyroiditis. Diffuse hypogenicity is observed in half to two-thirds of cases. The more pathognomonic presentation is the focal form, which can be found in more than 90% of cases. It is worth mentioning the three special forms. Although these can be included into one of the former categories, the special appearance is worth highlighting. These are the so-called honeycombing pattern and the micronodular form. The third is a less frequently mentioned and occurring subtype, which is characterized by a central large hyperkick field surrounded with econormal rim. Let's look at these in little more detail. Diffuse hypogenicity is the most well-known form of lymphocytic thyroiditis, surely among radiologists. However, this is not the most frequent presentation. The degree of hypogenicity varies and this is in relation to the severity of the thyroiditis. Let's see some examples. The left upper image comes from a healthy patient. This is an economal right lobe with a grayscale value of around 90. I remind you that the pixel intensity varies from 0 to 255, darker the structure, lower the value and conversely, lighter the structure, higher the value. The three other patients had lymphocytic thyroiditis and presented with diffuse hypogenicity. The left lower patient had a minimally hypochoic thyroid, the right upper had a moderately hypochoic thyroid. In both of them, the thyroid was lighter than the strep muscle running ventral to the lobe. The right lower image came from a patient who presented with deeply hypochoic thyroid which had a grayscale value lower than the strep muscle. An experienced examiner has no problem describing the images of the right as a hypochoic pattern. On the other hand, the distinction between the left images is a much more difficult task. There are two issues regarding the diffuse hypochoic form of lymphocytic thyroiditis. Both are concerning in those cases where focal lesions are missing. The first is that the thyroid becomes darker with age. Around 25% of patients elder than 70 years present with minimally moderately hypochoic thyroid. We may think that we do not cause a great problem if a mild hypochogenicity is not recognized. Such patients are most often new thyroid. However, in some cases, and especially in young women, it may be important to seek to detect mild hypochogenicity. In case of mild hypogenicity, the sensitivity of ATPO is significantly worse compared with advanced cases. We automatically recommend, even for youth thyroid and ATPO negative women, in childbearing period, a yearly TSH check and in the event of pregnancy at once. This will ensure timely detection of hypothyroidism and avoid miscarriage. Before moving forward with the presentation of lymphocytic thyroiditis, I demonstrate now with two examples the importance of the recognition of hypogenicity and the importance of its description. Both patients in their early 20s presented with a borderline ultrasound pattern. Their thyroids were economal and had several tiny hypochoic areas. Both a healthy thyroid and an evolving lymphocytic thyroiditis can present with this pattern. The patients were euthyroid and anti-TPO negative. I have suggested 
yearly TSA check and in the event of pregnancy at once. A couple of months later, both patients were referred again for evaluation. The woman on the left gave birth two months ago and the question was whether she should continue taking the levothyroxine supplementation set in the fifth week of pregnancy. In contrast to, the woman on the right was sent because she had two miscarriages within six months, the second two weeks earlier, in the 11th week of pregnancy. The TSH on the day before abortion was 8.2 milli international unit per liter. Of course, it cannot be said that the luckier woman gave birth to a healthy child because her hypothyroidism was recognized, while the other miscarried because of hypothyroidism was not recognized at the time. Of course, it cannot be said, but by no means can it be ruled out, and in this case the key was the recognition of a minimal degree of hypogenicity that can be recognized usually years or even decades before the onset of hypothyroidism. In contrast to, the woman on the left was sent because she had two miscarriages within six months, the second two weeks earlier, in the 11th week of pregnancy. The TSH on the day before abortion was 8.2 milli international unit per liter. The more frequent ultrasound appearance of lymphocytic thyroiditis is the so-called focal form, up to 95% of patients present with this. I enlisted the main features of this subtype. I emphasize here that these discrete lesions usually have irregular, lobulated or spicurated margins. So not only are they hypochoic, but they also present with irregular borders. It means that most of these lesions would belong to the most suspicious thyroid category in all classification systems if they would be regarded as nodules. The distinction from true nodules and the issue regarding the differentiation from true nodules will be discussed in the second part of the lecture. I give only two examples here. The left case should not cause concern. The thyroid is hypochoic and has more hypochoic discrete areas. This is the typical presentation of a lymphocytic thyroiditis. However, as we will see later, if we were to stick to the definition of the American Thyroid Association on thyroid nodule, we would and should have to call these discrete lesions as nodules. The case on the right is much more problematic. Nevertheless, the shape of the discrete lesions, the multiplicity, clearly stand for being these areas more active foci of thyroiditis than true nodules. The first out of the three special forms is the honeycombing presentation. This is characterized by numerous hypochaic islets separated either by connective tissue or economal thyroid from each other. The left case is patognomonic. Although in the right case a cystically degenerated thyroid lobe seems to be a condition to be considered, though analysis reveals that these are deeply hypochaic and not cystic areas. The honeycombing is a form that has no difficulty in recognizing or separating from the nodule and there is no concern about malignancy. The second special form is the so-called micronodular or pseudonodular or pseudolobular form of lymphocytic thyroiditis. These micronodules resemble the former, however the discrete lesions are larger, they range from several millimeters to 1 to 2 centimeters. The discrete lesions frequently differ in echogenicity, however the econormal or hyperechoic form is more frequent compared to the usual focal form or to the honeycombing pattern. In contrast to most cases of lymphocytic thyroiditis, the thyroid is usually enlarged. In the left example, the thyroid is normal sized. There are numerous econormal areas in a hypochoic background. The right case shows an enlarged thyroid. In this patient, not the entire lobe, but only the lower two-third is composed of discrete lesions. This right case illustrates the differential diagnostic issue of the micronodular form. It is frequently impossible to decide whether these discrete lesions are pathological nodules or not. 
Although the differentiation of this form from two modules is frequently impossible, even in histopathology, fortunately the differential diagnostic issue does not involve thyroid cancer. In contrast with the focal form of thyroiditis, this pattern does not cause oncological concern. The last special form is characterized by a central hypocrite field which is surrounded with econormal rim. The latter is not always complete. This form usually occurs in patients with long-standing hypothyroidism. The central hypocrite area has a rectangular shape, therefore the borders between the hypocrite and econormal parts are irregular. The thyroid is almost always decreased in size. Two examples. If we see only the transverse images, it rightly arises that these are hypercrit modules occupying most of the lobe. Longitudinal scan decides the issue in the right case. Note the infiltrative edges of the hypercrit part and the rectangular shape. This cannot be a true nodule. The left case is a bit more equivocal, but again the tail-like lower edge makes a true nodule a much less likely opportunity. Nevertheless, the distinction from a true nodule is not always possible. Now a few words about the difference in recognition lymphocytic thyroiditis in radiological and in endocrinological units. It is worth realizing the difference whether a patient is examined in the two units. In most of the former cases, the diagnosis is made by chance. The patient was referred for other reasons to ultrasound or other imaging study. In contrast with this situation, more than half of the patients harboring lymphocytic thyroiditis are presented with hypothyroidism in the endocrine unit. The second difference is in the opportunities in the two different medical units. In most cases, the radiologist can only rely on the ultrasound presentation. Three more diagnostic tools are available for the endocrinologist to give a correct diagnosis. He or she can consider the anamnestic data, the result of laboratory tests, and last but not least, he or she also has the special expertise. What is the significance of this in our daily practice? I give her the data of 113 consecutively examined patients who presented in a radiology unit before the clinical examination. The left column presents the diagnosis of the radiologist, while in the other three columns the final diagnoses are enlisted. First, let's see the discrepant diagnosis. The single healthy patient who was misdiagnosed as having lymphocytic thyroiditis was a very obese man with a decreased echogenicity caused not by thyroiditis but technical reasons. Four patients were falsely diagnosed as having nodules. Three had small cystic areas corresponding to dilated macrofollicles, while in the fourth patient an intrathyroidal vessel was misinterpreted as a nodule. Overall, a third of people, 5 out of 16 who turned out to be healthy, had a misdiagnosis. Let's see those patients whose final diagnosis was lymphocytic thyroiditis. In six patients, the hypocogenicity of the thyroid was overlooked. The radiologist is conditioned to recognize potentially cancerous lesions. However, on the one hand, in contrast to, for example, breast, significantly much less discrete thyroid lesions share oncological importance. On the other hand, the basic echogenicity has a huge relevance in the thyroid, a feature that the radiologist pays much less attention to. Both in terms of occurrence and clinical importance, the most important discrepancy was the overestimation of discrete lesions of thyroiditis. Be aware that more than half of lymphocytic thyroiditis cases were missed or misinterpreted by radiologists. All true nodules were recognized by the radiologist, which means a 100% sensitivity. Each of them performed excellently in what they were trained to do to recognize potentially malignant lesions. On the other hand, less than 50% of thyroiditis were recognized by the radiologist. 
And finally, the positive predictive value was only 64% for nodules. It means that in the third of cases, when the radiologist diagnosed the nodule, it was indeed a false diagnosis. And this is the very essence of the most important and most frequent problem faced by the clinician. At least one-fifth of all patients entering the thyroid unit comes with a false diagnosis and many of them also require psychological care to resolve their unnecessary anxiety. The effort spent on this cannot and should not be saved, but at the same time it takes extra time. Now it's time to apologize to the radiologist. As we shall see, the criticism that can be read from the table is not entirely legitimate and the radiologist can rightly say that she or he did nothing but adhere to the radiological definition of the nodule. So the other topic of this presentation is the relation between discrete lesions seen on ultrasound and true nodules, in other words the relation between appearance and reality. First I discuss the existing definition of thyroid nodule and its handling in the everyday practice will be demonstrated. I present the not very abundant literature data. Thereafter, those conditions will be discussed in which the differentiation of discrete lesions have great relevance. So, let's see how to define the nodule in the literature. There is only one complete definition of the nodule in ultrasound which was mentioned in two American Pirate Association guidelines. As we can see, the definition does not consider either the size of the lesion or the degree of difference in echogenicity between the lesion and the surrounding parenchyma. Moreover, even normally occurring intertidal vessels, echogenic fibers of connective tissue belong to nodules according to this definition. On this definition, not only almost every thyroid disorder, but great proportion of normal thyroids are categorized as nodules. We can make two considerations. First, we exclude normal conditions from the nodule category. Equiabnormalities caused by technical artifacts should be also excluded from nodule category. This table enlists, in decreasing order, thyroid diseases presenting hypercritic lesions. Normal conditions are not involved. We can see that the two leading diseases are not pathological nodules, but various forms of thyroiditis. In the case of hypocogenic lesions, thyroid cancer only comes in order of frequency after the two forms of thyroiditis. We can make another consideration without further ado. It is worth excluding from the nodule category those lesions which are less than 5 mm in maximal diameter because there is no one protocol which suggests any further examinations in such cases. The situation has become a bit better, but essentially remained unchanged. We can conclude that even the definition in restricted terms is practically useless. Overwhelming majority of thyroiditis cases are still enlisted among thyroid nodules. To summarize, if we literally interpret the single available definition of thyroid nodule, then virtually every adult has a nodular goiter. This extreme exaggeration would have obvious detrimental consequences both for the person under investigation and for the investigation system as a whole. The only reliable definition of thyroid nodule is practically useless and most investigators simply ignore this. These are facts. The resulting conclusion is self-evident. Most investigators, when they see a discrete lesion, interpret them and call some of them nodule and some not. The problem is that this interpretation is hardly uniform, at least there is no discussion of it in the literature, so obviously there can be no consensus on this. In this table I suggest another approach based on the definition and extend it with some considerations. From a practical point of view, it is worth maintaining the term nodule for lesions greater than 5 mm because small lesions do not require any further diagnostic steps. The use of a larger limit of 10 mm should definitely be considered and in fact I myself only call larger lesions as nodule. 
Here the controversial situation is that all guidelines are inconsistent with lesions between 5 and 10 mm. On the one hand, all thyroid systems recommend in their main table that cytological xanthine be considered only for nodules larger than 10 mm. However, in the text, all suggest considering finding respiration for lesions showing suspicious signs between 5 and 10 mm. I think the only forward-looking approach is to use the term nodule in a pathological sense. If not all discrete lesions are called nodules, a process of interpretation is unavoidable. As I mentioned, most investigators have done this so far, therefore in reality that doesn't mean anything new. This is an ongoing learning process with lesions that we misinterpreted. This is not just about human error, but there are objective limitations to ultrasound. In many cases, it is not possible to decide whether a lesion is a nodule or not. In this case, it is worth displaying the uncertainty in the medical report. For example, the term nodule-like or discrete lesion may be used for such cases. Of course, the ultrasound pattern is the most important, but not the only element in the interpretation. In the ultrasound pattern, it is very important to look not only at the discrete lesion, but also at the environment of the lesion, that is, the entire lobe, but rather the entire thyroid gland. Consideration of clinical data, for example the presence of pain or fever, may be crucial in subacute inflammation. Laboratory data, such as high ATP level, can be a major help in many cases. Never forget that in almost all cases the cause for hypothyroidism is autoimmune thyroiditis. In an operated patient, knowledge of histological diagnosis may be decisive. It is unlikely that a discrete lesion seen in a histologically non-nodular patient who underwent surgery for Graves' disease two years ago would be a true nodule. In what it follows, I will talk about the most important and most frequently occurring of the six special situations where a discrete lesion seen on ultrasound is not or not always a pathological nodule. I enlisted these six patterns when significant proportion of discrete lesions are not true nodules. Among them, the discrete hyperbic lesions of thyroiditis cause the greatest concern. This is by far the most common in as many as more than a third of patients on an average order. It is most common here that we cannot give an answer as to whether this is a real nodule or not. In addition to, most of the discrete lesions seen in autoimmune thyroiditis would be thyroid 5 rated if considered as nodules. Due to the infiltrative nature of thyroiditis, a discrete lesion is characterized by irregular shape and borders similarly to a papillary cancer. Moreover, many foci of thyroiditis have intranular echogenic lines and granules. Although these are presentations of connective tissue, they can be misinterpreted as microcalcifications. Although most foci of thyroiditis tend to be small, a significant proportion of these lesions are larger than 10 mm. And last but not least, compared with non-metaplastic lesions, aspiration cytology is less reliable in oxidative lesions and not infrequently results in suspicion of Hurtle cell tumor, it, that is, false positive diagnosis. I present some examples of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. This is the most characteristic presentation of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Numerous relatively small hyperopic areas are within an echonormal background. These lesions have not regular geometrical shape and present with irregular borders. Note the multiplicity of the discrete areas. These two cases are again relatively easy to judge. Smaller and large hyperopic fields can be seen. These have irregular borders and their shape is not of regular geometrical. Note that in one single section there are at least five smaller discrete lesions in the left while around 10 in the right patient. This case is a bit more difficult to judge. However, the non-geometrical shape and the multiplicity of the discrete lesions are of help in avoiding misinterpreting the largest hypothetic lesions as nodules. 
we must accept that there are objective limitations. The presentations of these cases are very similar, almost identical. Histopathology disclosed the follicular adenoma in the left discrete lesion, while the right lesion proved to be only a focus of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Two other examples are presented, which demonstrate the limitations of thyroid ultrasound. Both patients presented with the focal form of Hashimoto thyroiditis, but the largest lesion proved to be the only largest focus of thyroiditis in the left case, while it did a papillary cancer in the right one. The question is whether the hypercogenic discrete lesion seen is a more active focus of the autoimmune process or a true nodule. The relatively frequent coexistence of papillary cancer and Hashimoto thyroiditis further increases the severity of the problem. I've summarized in this table the most important viewpoints of differentiation. Several ultrasound features might have a role in the differentiation. The least reliable is the size of the lesion, which although tends to be smaller in thyroiditis than in true nodules, the distinction on size has minimal practical relevance. The diffuse hypochoric background is of great help in recognition of an underlying autoimmune process and can raise the possibility that the coexistent focal lesions can be only more active foci of thyroiditis than a real nodule. Although a diffuse hypochogenicity is of help avoiding false diagnosis of a nodule in the event of a coexistent discrete lesion, it does not tell anything about the differentiation. We have to and can rely on the next three features when judging a discrete lesion as only more active foci of thyroiditis or a true nodule. The demonstration of fibrosis within a discrete lesion increases the likelihood of the former. The most important features of a more active foci of thyroiditis are the multiplicity and the irregular shape and borders. The presence of true nodule is more likely in that lesion, which echo pattern differs from the other discrete lesions. The presence of microcalcification has importance and significantly raises the possibility of thyroid cancer. The role of microcalcification is unique because we cannot rely on other suspicious characteristics on the irregular borders and shape which are common in discrete lesions of thyroiditis. Finally, I emphasize again the superiority of longitudinal scanning over transverse section in the judgment. To summarize the lecture, I quote an Italian grump. The ultrasound of lymphocytic thyroiditis and the relation between discrete lesions and pathological nodules belong to the most difficult areas of thyroid ultrasound. The importance of careful wording is very important if we consider that an inaccurate wording can cause more harm than a thyroid disease can itself. The last table presents the papers which were used by preparing the lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.